Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm preaching through the book of 1 Peter. We now arrive at chapter 3, having to do primarily uh, with words to wives, but also uh, a word to husbands as well. Uh, Peter is talking about the cross of Christ in our lives. That if we trust in Christ as our Savior and what He's done on the cross, that cross uh, translates into the very fabric of our lives and how we respond to various uh, institutions. The first institution was the institution of, of the government in chapter uh, 2, verse 13. The second institution was the institution of uh, you might say the economic realm of, of household servants under a household head. That's chapter 2, verse 18. And now we come to the domestic or the marital uh, expression of the, of the worldly institution and how the cross uh, comes to bear upon uh, that. Chapter 3. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. But this is how the holy women of uh, the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Heavenly Father, may your Holy Spirit be with us to receive your word, be shaped by it for your glory and for Christ's sake. We pray in his name. Amen. There's an old saying that says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Depends who is looking to determine whether or not what they're looking at is beautiful or not. A number of years ago, there was an article, a matter of fact, it was on the front page, as I very cover, as I recall. The topic of beauty. Uh, beauty particularly having to do with uh, the various cultures of the world and how different cultures had different ideas about what would constitute beauty. But one thing was the constant that the article wanted to point out is that every culture seems obsessed with it, <laughs> uh, even though their versions of it may be uh, widely different. Well, the Bible, in speaking of the virtuous and excellent wife in Proverbs 31, says that charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But the woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. For Samuel, there's a line that says, Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. So the problem with beauty is not that uh, there's something wrong with, with beauty externally. Uh, there isn't. Uh, the Bible recognized even that Rachel was more beautiful than Leah uh, without batting an eye or blushing over the statement. But the problem has to do with giving beauty the wrong kind of attention. Where should real attention be located with regard to seeking and admiring and appreciating the beautiful? That is the burning question. Because the Bible is quite clear. It's the inward beauty of a godly character that is important and is precious in the sight of God. Not 
one more of the unchanging fashions that constitute beauty in this world. You might say the very central weighty line in 1 Peter chapter 3 is this, that which is in God's sight very precious, very costly. It's the internal, not the external. And so Peter, as he writes in this section about uh, alien uh, people in a fallen world, wants us uh, to notice how to be dressed. And he wants us to dress to be noticed. Dress not noticed by the eye of man, but dress to be noticed by the eye of God. Let the excellence of godliness on the inside be your point of attention and draw to what is beautiful. That is the words of Peter. As I mentioned, there were three areas in which Peter is uh, speaking and addressing aliens in this world. As we've noticed earlier, Peter identifies us as believers as aliens. We're, uh, our true homeland is in heaven. Uh, and that's our point of reference for identifying ourselves as we pass through this world, which is a, a temporal affair. And as we do so, Peter wants us to be pursuers of godliness, pursuers of Christ, pursuers of Christ and His cross. And it comes to bear upon our submission to governmental authority, to household authority, and in the context of the marriage relationship. So the first thing that Peter addresses is that in, in many cases, uh, a wife may be married to a man who's not a Christian. How do, should you respond? What should you do? Wives, be subject, he says, to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Peter wants the Christian woman to do what? Not to play along with the world standards. Oh, I'll get him, I'll get his attention this way. Or I'll get him to like me this way. I'll get him drawn into me this way. No, Peter wants the attention to be drawn in how? By the conduct of your life. By a life that is quiet, respectful, and Peter, it's translated here by the ESV, pure conduct. That's the word from which you get our word holiness. So it's, 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 it's holy and reverent uh, is to characterize your life. And let that speak to your unbelieving husband. And not only allowing that to speak to your unbelieving husband, but Peter says, win them without a word. Don't even, bring, don't even seek to preach to them. Yes, it's true. Undoubtedly, <laughs> that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That is completely biblical. Souls get saved by hearing the gospel. But in this context, in this kind of a relationship, Peter is saying, no, let the voice that is heard from you to your unbelieving husband, who's already prejudiced against you, I'm sure, be the voice of your conduct. And let them potentially win him over. That's, Peter says, that's where the power is. St. Augustine, in his confessions, wrote of his, fa his mother, Monica, a woman who prayed and prayed and prayed many years for her son's conversion. And it wasn't until sometime in his 30s he was finally converted to the Lord. And of course, she also prayed for her unbelieving husband. And Augustine writes this about his mother, Monica, in his confessions. She served her husband as her master and did all she could to win him for you, speaking to him of you by her conduct, by which you made her beautiful. Finally, when her husband was at the end of his earthly span, she gained him for you. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to read it again. 
She served her husband as her master and did all she could to win him for you, speaking to him of you by her conduct, by which you made her beautiful. Finally, when her husband was at the end of his earthly span, she gained him for you. Uh, and I have a, uh, a reenactment of the life of uh, Augustine. Ashley is done from the Catholic Church. But in that reenactment of the life of Augustine, it has that part that as Patricius is dying, uh, he finally converts and asks for baptism uh, as uh, he observed his godly wife, Monica, and did exactly what Peter said, uh, won him over by her excellent uh, conduct. Let him see... Dear wife, what you are wearing. Not on the outside, but on the inside. That is where the power uh, is at. And Peter goes on to explain what he means by that in verses 3 and 4 uh, when he says, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry and the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very uh, precious. Peter says, let uh, the internal beauty be the thing that you're drawing attention, not the outside. He mentions the hair, mentions jewelry, uh, and he mentions dresses. Now, it's just interesting that the Apostle Paul uh, similarly mentions uh, uh, about godly women, how the things that shouldn't really uh, be occupying and drawing their attention, uh, he, he mentions the hair, and he also mentions putting on of costly, or putting on of costly uh, garments. This word costly, this very same word that Paul says having to do with costly garments, uh, Peter uses where he says, when God sees your real inner garment, that is costly to God that is expensive that is of great value to God so let the value be what God sees not what man sees now of course you get into all kinds of discussions and I'm not going to fall into that trap today you know well, what hairstyles can I wear and which ones are acceptable and uh, you know uh, I, I, rem I remember when Sharon and I went to the Bahamas. I, in another life, I won a trip to the Bahamas through my work. And we went to the Bahamas. And we couldn't get from the bus to the beach with about a half a dozen people wanting to braid Sharon's hair. <laughs> uh, how would you like a Bahama Mama hairstyle? You know, how about a French braid? <laughs> Uh, very consumed. Well, we, we got through without the hair braids. We did get a t-shirt and a mug, but um, that's the emphasis, though. You know, the, the hair looking this way, the clothes this way, the jewelry this way. Uh, look, pray about it, ladies. Ask God to guide you in what is fitting and suitable, and pleasing to Him and, and, and as appropriate to who you are, and then, and then go with that humbly before the Lord. I, I think that's the wisest uh, pathway to take. But remembering, it's the inner person. There's where the real preparation, there's where the real value is at. And Peter says, let it be the hidden person of the heart, the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Now that word gentle, is this not a word applied to women? That word gentle, the Lord Jesus said, I am gentle and humble in heart. And so Peter is telling, look, the Lord Jesus perfectly embodies human gentleness. Now ladies, in a feminine form of that gentleness, allow that to be your adorning. Because that is Christ-like in nature. And to be quiet. Now again, Peter is emphasizing what? He's emphasizing the fact, look, you know, as women, uh, you are talkers. Uh, and, and look, uh, 
I know that women are better talkers than men. I, I know that. Uh, there's been scientific studies done along those lines of little boys and little girls where they'll attach a tape recorder to them and they'll record what the sounds they make throughout the day. The little boy's so sounds throughout the day go like this. Like that. That's a lot. The little girl sounds are what? They're talking. They're conversing <laughs> back and forth. It's something about the way God has wired us that women especially have a natural verbal dexterity that exceeds um, men, by and large. By and large. I used to work as a security guard in a uh, retirement center. All the women would gather together. They'd be pulled together, talking. The men tended to drift apart and be quiet. There's something about human nature that works that way. Men, we need to work on it more. There's no doubt about it. As men, we need to work to become better communicators. That which comes naturally to our women, we need to work on more. And so Peter tells us it, that this is a beautiful thing to have this gentle and quiet spirit and not always using your words to, to get what you're after, but to have that trust in God. Is Peter telling women you can't talk? No, of course not. As Peter says, when you come to church, don't say anything to any men. Of course not. That's not where he's getting at at all. He's after the inner quality of that person and how it comes out in your life and your relationship. Because why? Because of this simple thing. It is very costly. Very beautiful. In the eyes of God. And whose attention do you want, ladies? The attention of a man or the attention of God? If you're a godly woman who loves Christ, do you know the answer? I know the answer to that question. You want the attention of God. You want Him looking at you. And you want to have His communion with, with you through Jesus Christ to come out uh, in your life. And Peter says, look, uh, what he's saying to you uh, is not something new. Uh, Peter wants to say, look, this isn't just for me as an apostle with regard to my little circle of influence, and now I'm laying this on you. He goes on to say, this is how the women of old conducted themselves. Uh, they were models of the kind of woman that I'm speaking of. This has always been part and parcel uh, of the lives of godly women. For this is how, verse 5, this is how the holy women who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now let me get one thing out of the way here. Uh, I am not recommending, ladies, that you call your husband Lord uh, because if you do, uh, that guy is going to become an irritant to me. So uh, let, let's not say that this is what Peter is going after. Uh, uh, but what is he going after? Uh, and, and so men, uh, you know, I, I've, I've yet to hear of a man who requires of his wife that she call me Lord or Sir. Uh, I, I haven't run into that. And I'm glad for that, you know. Uh, there is still some residual humility left uh, in the Christian men of this world. But what's the point that's going on here? Uh, the point is observing. What? That there is a uh, relationship uh, of headship between the, wife, the husband and the wife that, that is retained in the marriage relationship. And it's to be a relationship of beauty, a, a relationship of submission. That's the word that's used, submitting to their own husbands, just like servants are to be in submission to their masters, just like citizens are to be in submission uh, to their governing institutions. It's the same word. You, you can't get around it. Um, I, I read an article recently. Uh, uh, there was an anti-patriarchal uh, article that I read by a, a lady and uh, said that, well, patriarchy came about after the fall. Uh, that's when men uh, were assigned as heads in their homes. Well, I scratched my head over that because 1 Peter chapter or First uh, Timothy chapter two, 
Paul goes back to creation to say, here's where it was instituted. Adam was created first and then Eve. And there's the picture of, of uh, headship in the marital relationship. Uh, uh, I agreed with the woman that, that uh, uh, there are a lot of abusive men in this world. There are abusive Christian men in this world. There are abusive Christian men who abuse their wife physically. There are abusive Christian men who abuse their wives, their wives uh, verbally. Uh, in, in other ways, and it is wickedness to the core. Does that mean, okay, uh, we got to just get rid of husbands altogether? Uh, you know, uh, it's just like kids with crummy parents. Well, let's just do away with parenthood altogether. No, that's not the answer. The answer isn't in the fact that God has designed a structure to occur within the marriage relationship. That's not the point. The point is you got two sinners in that relationship acting in sinful ways and men, if in any way you're acting that way, then repent. That's unbecoming to you as a Christian man. And it's certainly not helping your wife. Because what does Peter goes on to go on to say here? Is that she is what? She's a, a weaker vessel. Meaning what? What does that mean that the wife is a weaker vessel? Boy, the commentators go all over the place and try to understand what possibly that means. And uh, uh, I, w I, would, I would venture... Uh, to say this, that Peter's reference to the wife as a weaker vessel is recognizing that she has a delicacy in her constitution that is beautiful, like a flower that, it, that may be delicate and is beautiful, and that, that she's created to show forth that vulnerable delicacy in her personality, but it, it puts her in a position of vulnerability. And, th and that's what I would interpret to be what is meant by weaker uh, vessel. Uh, it's not that he's always going to beat her in an arm wrestling contest. Uh, it, 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 I think it has to do with uh, the constitution of the delicacy of the feminine soul and uh, what it tends uh, to show forth in its vulnerability of seeking to carry out her life before God in uh, a rightful submission to her husband. But, but Peter doesn't end here. Uh, he's Yes, first he's saying to the wives, here's how you show forth Christ in your marriage. That's the point. The point isn't, hey, women men need to be in subjection. That's not the point. The point is, here's how you show forth Christ. What did Christ do? Christ came in submitting, him, submitting himself for our sake in love to the most horrendous suffering of the Father's judgment for us and for our salvation. He took up his cross in submission. He was gentle of soul. And so Peter is saying, here, here's how you to show forth this Christ likeness. And then he, he appeals to the husband that he too, uh, on the other side of the equation, is to show forth Christ likeness. Men. Husbands, likewise. There's the word same thing for likewise. Uh, likewise what? Likewise, here's how you are to show forth your cross-carrying in love. Live with your wives in an understanding way. That's a word for knowing. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So we as men are called to un be understanding listeners to our wives who like to talk so we can understand, know them, and understand how to care and respond to them. Live with them in an understanding way. Seek to be understanding. And look, I've been married 40 years now. And I, you know, some of you have been married for 20 years or, or more. And, you know, it's a learning process all the way. You, you never, as a man, you never get to the point where you go, okay, I got this. You know, she's not going to be mad at me this week at all. You know, because I've got this figured out. Well, hopefully you've learned a few things. I've learned a few things. And hopefully you have too. But this is the, this is the position that we are specifically called to. Why? Men tend to what? Like the little kid with a recording, boom, 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 you know, just plow through life. Peter's seeking to reel in that component. Live with your wife in an understanding way. To know her, to understand her. Showing what? Honor. 
Wow, that's fantastic. Showing honor to the woman as what? The weaker vessel. You don't abuse that. You actually lift it up. Just like a, a man that would carry a, a very uh, expensive and delicate uh, v- vase uh, from one room to another. Uh, he just went put it under his arm like a, a football or a loaf of bread and go to the next room. He'd be very concerned. I don't, God, I don't want to drop this. This is very expensive. And very carefully carry it from one room to the other. That He would honor it. And thus we are to honor the woman as the weaker vessel since, now here it is, they are heirs with you of the grace of life. There's the point where a man is made in the image of God, a woman is made in the image of God. They are equally the image of God. One is not less the image. And since they are both the image of God, they both share together, as Peter says, in the grace of life, the new life they have in Jesus Christ. Though as woman, as man, as they seek to know Christ and ask questions, how does Christ desire to reflect himself in and through my life as I take up my cross in humility before him. It's going to have a little different hue for the man and for the woman. But it's the same grace that they share together. And it says, especially to us men, that your prayers may not be hindered. That word for hindered means uh, intruded upon. Interrupted. And if you're a Christian man and a praying man and your relationship with your wife is one in which you're guilty of hindering that relationship, we need to stop. We need to ask ourselves. And we need to correct it because it's going to impact our spiritual life. You know, God doesn't allow you to just go off and be all spiritual and while you're hurting your wife, you've got to come back and ask for forgiveness and ask for the grace of Christ in your lives together that your prayers may not be hindered. So brothers and sisters, God has called us to focus where? On the inner life. Who you are on the inside before God. This is what is of great value. You may look in the mirror and you may say, I wish my nose was this, that, or the other thing. I wish my cheeks were higher. I wish my mouth... I wi- you know, you, there may be all kinds of things you may look at. And some of those things, maybe cosmetically, you can do something about. But by and large, you are who you are. Yeah, that's the frame of your life. What's the important part? The frame? No. It's the picture. And God developing the picture within you. That's the costly part. And brothers and sisters, let us cooperate with God by not adopting the values of this world where it's the external that is looked upon and valued highly, but the internal the internal transformational part of being conformed to Christ in the beauty of his gentleness and in the wonder uh, of his love. Taking up his cross individually, taking up the cross together as husband and wife in Jesus Christ as we journey through this world, as Peter says, as aliens. We're different. We're different people with a different motivation, a different love, and a different destination. We're aliens. We belong in heaven where Christ is, and we'll be with him forever. Amen? Amen.